Hi everyone, um, Phil Travis, your instructor here at EOU for the Civil War and Reconstruction History 458. Um, this week, week six, we are going to be in this lesson looking at the year 1862. Um, 1862 was a year in which it really seemed that um, the war would soon be won for the Union. Um, the Army of the Potomac, of uh, General McClellan, um, and also Irving McDowell seemed to close in on Richmond. Uh, McClellan's forces even got within earshot of the bells of the churches of Richmond. Um, there was political turmoil within the South as the South um, had Jefferson Davis had enacted martial law in certain parts of the South. There were economic issues in some cases. There were accusations of Davis um, uh, being a tyrannical leader in some cases. There was some political disunion in the South. Um, and it appeared to be going the wrong way by the early spring of 1862. However, the tide of the war was really changed for a brief period of time by exceptional leadership from the Army of Northern Virginia, which was the army led by Robert E. Lee and, of course, Robert E. Lee's two right-hand men, Jeb Stuart, and Stonewall Jackson, who fought in the Shenandoah Valley. Together, Lee's army with Jackson and Stuart um, would win incredible victories that have left military historians truly astonished at their skill and savvy um, as, 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 as military minds um, in, in winning victories that, in some cases, they were outnumbered almost two to one. So it's a moment, 1862 into 1863, in which you see Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stuart win some of their most stellar and surprising and impressive military victories of all times. Victories that um, prolong the Civil War, but also victories that have left uh, military historians really um, impressed by the incredible skill and savvy of these exceptional Confederate leaders. One of the reasons, of course, for the um, successes of the Confederacy in Virginia during 1862 and part of 1863 was exceptional um, leadership, particularly exceptional Virginia leadership. Um, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson, and Jeb Stuart. Um, Lee, of course, became the head of the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, and he was quiet, and he was criticized um, quite a bit um, before people saw his actually brilliance as a, as a, as a strategic-minded um, leader. Lee also used um, what might be called an offensive-defensive strategy. And what this meant is that Lee took measures to assure that the capital, Richmond, uh, would not fall. He took measures that would be defensive in nature and use those defensive measures, like, for example, using Stonewall Jackson to divert, di to divert um, the forces of Irving McDowell, um, and then using those, those diversionary tactics or those defensive tactics, he would then strike with aggressive attacks at vulnerable areas of his opponent on the flanks, for example, of McClellan's forces, as he would do during the Seven Days Battle. Um, Stonewall Jackson, who is pictured here, was, of course, Lee's um, right-hand man, if you will. He was Lee's um, mobile, um, mobile military commander. Um, Jackson, who was, who was born in Clarksburg, Virginia, and, of course, today it's West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia becomes a state during the Civil War, of course, as they join the Union and break off from Virginia. But Jackson is also one of these great Virginia leaders. Um, he was he was devoutly religious to a point where some people even suggested that his devout Presbyterianism almost made him fanatical in some cases. He was quiet and secretive, eccentric, and very hard. Um, Jackson did not kind of understand um, soldier exhaustion the way that one might. If a soldier was exhausted and falling by the side of the trail in these hard marches as he fought multiple battles in the Shenandoah Valley, he would chalk it up oftentimes to um, a lack of patriotism. He was a hard man, and he drove his troops hard, but he was highly successful. And his, high, his, his great success, uh, his great successes 
won him great admiration from his Confederate soldiers and also from those in the North who, you know, uh, viewed Jackson with a, with, with, a, with a certain military reverence once they saw how efficient he was. And, and the thing that made him so famous was um, the fact that he was able to use a smaller force and defeat multiple larger armies within the Shenandoah Valley, particularly. Um, his philosophy was to mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy. And it's a perfect example of using mobility, ter terrain that you understand, and speed of movement to catch your opponent by surprise, to outwit their action before they're able to understand your action. And uh, he was highly successful in this. He was, until he's, until he's fatally shot, um, wounded, and he dies of his wounds by his own troops at Chancellorsville, um, Jackson was an absolutely integral part of Robert E. Lee's strategies for the Virginia campaigns. Lee used Jackson as a diversionary tactic in some cases. He would send him into the Shenandoah Valley uh, near the Blue Ridge Mountains, and Jackson would use his mobile forces to attack and engage larger Union forces, catch them by surprise, and he won crushing victories. And of course, it was far more difficult for Union troops to operate in these areas because they not only faced hostilities from Confederate forces, they also faced um, a, a rather um, unwilling populace in the towns that they, that they went through. And of course, Lincoln infamously encouraged Irvin McDowell's forces to pursue and to try to chase Jackson through the Shenandoah Valley in 62. And of course, Jackson was continuously outmaneuvering and outwitting his opponent in the Shenandoah uh, campaign. And it, Lincoln's choice of sending McDowell to pursue Jackson in this way, which very much played into the diversionary intent that Lee had in mind, has been remembered as one of the great um, strategic blunders that Lincoln made at the early periods of the war. The other of this kind of triumvirate of great leaders for the Confederacy in, in Virginia was Jeb Stuart. And uh, Jeb Stuart, who was born in Patrick County, Virginia, um, Jeb Stuart was the eyes and the ears, if you will, of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. He was a cavalryman. He was sort of like the original cavalier. He had this red-lined cape. That should, be cap, that should be cape there, not cap. I'll correct that spelling, actually, when I put this up for you guys. He had this red-lined cape. Um, he wore a yellow sash. He had incredible equestrian skills. He was from the Virginia gentry class, and so he was an incredibly horseman. He was an incredibly exceptional horseman, and uh, he continually um, showed his prowess to be far above that of his adversaries, particularly in 1862 and 63. Jeb Stewart was famous during the Seven Days Battle for his famous ride around McClellan in which Jeb Stewart took his cavalry and rode all the way around the perimeter of McClellan's forces, and he provided integral intelligence to Robert E. Lee. His mobility, his ability to move his cavalry in forward positions, his ability to move his cavalry behind the lines of the enemy to understand where their open flanks were, their flanks that were not guarded by rivers or human constructed um, impediments were, incre were incredibly um, integral to Lee being able to successfully attack when he needed to attack. This picture here, of course, is Robert E. Lee, uh, one of the less common pictures you see of Robert E. Lee. And I show you this picture because Robert E. Lee is sitting astride his most well-known military horse, Traveler. Um, Traveler um, was used by Lee oftentimes in the war, and um, it was the horse traveler was was known for its speed, and um, and he died shortly after Robert E. Lee died. Traveler did in 1870. Um, so I wanted to show you this this picture of Robert E. Lee astride his his horse um, traveler, which sometimes we forget that some of these early uh, George Washington had Nelson, and uh, Robert E. Lee had Traveler. Many of our early pre- or, or, or pseudo-industrial, I guess the Civil War is an industrial war, of course, but it's still, you see components from the pre-industrial period, and it was very common, the horse, um, the cavalry, 
Um, the horse was an incredible, Im- incredibly important military um, tool for the mobility that it provided. And so from this era of warfare, um, the equestrian skills of commanders like Robert E. Lee pictured here, also, of course, Jeb Stuart, even more significant, was a very important um, part of warfare. And, and in some cases, soldiers had close affinities to certain horses like this one here, Traveler. So in the summer of 1862, the Union, uh, the Army of the Potomac, uh, headed up by General George B. McClellan, began what's known as the Peninsula Campaign. And the Peninsula Campaign ultimately becomes uh, really a terrible failure for the Union and um, a great success for Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, The idea, the goal was in 1862, the strategic goal for the Union was to take the capital. They believed you take the capital of Richmond, and they believed you could take the capital of Richmond, and probably along with it, much of Lee's army, since they were defending that area, um, that that could bring an end to the war. Um, General George B. McClellan was given the charge of of this of this job of of going up the peninsula. I'll show you a map in a moment. Going up the peninsula um, near where Williamsburg is, and I'll show you maps so you understand the geography and going towards Richmond and taking the capital. General George B. McClellan, who's pictured here up at the top, was. Um, really rather popular by his troops. He also was a, was a pretty strong political voice in the North. He was noted for um, his excellence as a drill master of his troops and organizing his troops. He also was um, liked by his troops because he would not sacrifice his troops. Um, McClellan refused to, um, refused to send his troops into battle unless he had a, a distinct superior advantage and felt very confident that he could win. He would not aggressively attack and take the initiative um, to try to seize a victory as he was afraid of sacrificing his troops and destroying his company, which he had fought so hard to train and put together. Uh, it's kind of the opposite for Lee, where Lee uses um, his defensive off- offensive strategy with uh, Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah, Jeb Stewart, you know, doing intelligence reconnaissance, and then attacking aggressively with, um, um, in some cases, um, outnumbered forces. And Lee's initiative, his aggressive action, was really the thing that gave them the ability to to win these early battles in 1863 and in parts of uh, 1862 and in parts of 1863. So here, as you see in this picture, I'm going to show you a map here in just a second. But first, I want to talk about this little, this image here. This image, which in one respect shows you the, the really highly diverse nature of artillery during the Civil War. Um, oftentimes, we think about the Civil War and we think only about pitched battles on battlefields where armies meet on a battlefield and, and one leaves the battle and one is considered the victor. And that happens many times at places like Gettysburg. However... Um, there are also um, siege techniques used um, during the Civil War. There are also trenches dug during the Civil War and other types of defensive fortifications. Robert E. Lee, when he began um, what becomes known as the Seven Days Battle, when he, begun, when he begins his defense of Richmond and also his aggressive counterattack to McClellan's campaign in, in 1862, um, defended Richmond with defensive trenches and foxholes and these types of things. He was criticized for this, actually, by Southerners who said, you're preparing for a siege. Uh, Robert E. Lee was not preparing for a siege. He was preparing to defend the capital of Richmond, and then he was going to use his intelligence from Jeb Stuart to attack the exposed flanks of McClellan's forces and to take an aggressive advantage, which succeeded greatly for him, albeit at a great cost. But you can see here these Union um, artillery unit here with their mortar artillery. These are mortar cannons that were used to siege positions uh, of the Confederate forces around the area of Yorktown in 1862. Um, So there's incredible diversity in artillery during the Civil War. And uh, you have some that are more traditionally look, more traditional looking artillery pieces. And you have others like this, which are um, somewhat unique looking siege mortars, if you will. 
Here's a, here's a map that shows you the area we're talking about. And so you see um, the York River and the James River form this peninsula. And the red line here at the bottom is where that siege at Yorktown was occurring. So McClellan's forces sailed down in the Chesapeake Bay and landed um, at the tip of the peninsula. And they would then move up, on the ca move up to the capital of Richmond um, on the rivers, um, and they would try to siege the capital. Now, uh, siege and ultimately take the capital and hopefully Robert Lee's forces with it. Uh, McClellan actually, again, being a very... Uh, being a, a general who did not want to lead his army into a battle unless he had overwhelming numbers, had actually taken more, um, more troops than he had told Lincoln he was going to take. And Lincoln became very concerned about this. He heard about this. And Lincoln recalled um, some of McClellan's forces to go back to Washington and defend the capital because he was afraid that, you know, you send your troops all the way down here to this peninsula. If you fail, it's going to leave the capital of Washington, D.C., which is very close to Richmond, of course. It's going to leave it open for a counterattack by the forces of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. And so there was a, a, a tension between Lincoln and McClellan. And after the peninsula campaign, Lincoln will be uh, Lincoln will uh, ask for, for Le McClellan to, to be re reposted. McClellan will be taken off of the top command of the Army of Potomac. He'll be returned again later. Um, during the Seven Days Battle, um, the Seven Days Battle ultimately becomes a great success for Lee. Um, Lee used the intelligence provided by Jeb Stuart, his cavalryman, who famously rode around McClellan's lines in, in the ride around McClellan, providing intelligence. Um, Stonewall Jackson, while late to the battlefield, provided important assistance as well, and ultimately it's a great success for Lee. The Peninsula Campaign is a failure for the Union. However, the Seven Days Battle was also tremendously costly for Lee. It came at a huge cost, about twice the cost of, of the Union, and it, it was this, this campaign in the summer of, of 1862 cost uh, something like double the amount of casualties as took place in all of the Mississippi theater, the West, during that same year. So it's an incredibly costly campaign, but a great success for Lee nonetheless. After this, um, you will see um, Lee push north towards Maryland. Um, you will have the Second Battle of Bull Run. Um, and, of course, Lee will ultimately push into Maryland um, and you will see the Battle of Antietam, which becomes the bloodiest day of the war, as Lee again, Lee tries to go into Maryland because he's hoping he can win a major victory near the nation's capital or near Philadelphia or near Baltimore that could encourage the Union to seek a peace treaty and also might encourage, and also might encourage foreign powers to uh, agree to acknowledge the Confederacy, which was a central plank um, a central goal of the, of the Confederates when it came to trying to achieve victory. They needed to get international support, and they needed big victories against the North or the Union to, 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 to gain a treaty that would result in a recognition of the Confederacy. So Antietam happens several months after the Peninsula Campaign in September of 1862, um, it's also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, and McClellan was back in command at Antietam. Now, the goal here for Lee, Lee pushed into Maryland, and his goal was, as we laid out the objectives in that earlier slide, his goal was to win a major offensive victory and force a treaty. So he wanted to threaten the capitals or threaten Philadelphia or threaten Baltimore, and in so doing, um, force, force the... Um, the Union to agree to a treaty that would recognize the South. There's two invasions during the war. This is the first invasion of the North. The second one, of course, occurs with Gettysburg. As you read, you know, the battle carried out and Union troops found a Confederate battle, battle plan. Um, and the battle winds up being the bloodiest day of the war with about 17,000 wounded and about 6,000 dead in one day. Um, and Lee ultimately goes across, you know, has to, he has to return. It's technically a victory for the Union, though in terms of what happened on the battlefield, it was hard to give any one side the victory. But it really was a victory for the Union in a strategic sense because Lee had to go back to Virginia after the battle. He left the battlefield first, albeit on his own volition. Um, but the key to this is, 
was that neither the British or the French would recognize the South. Um, and so they really, at this point, had failed to be able to successfully bring in international involvement. And so it really was a strategic victory for the North, despite the cost. There was also um, significant fighting in the West at this time, early on in the war, the West being the Mississippi uh, River area. And, uh, of course, Ulysses S. Grant was particularly famous for the Union um, in these campaigns. Um, Grant kind of earned his, his claim to fame in the West before he was appointed to the Army of the Potomac. Um, Grant, who was a West Point graduate, he had fought at the Mexican-American War, um, won a first uh, victory at Fort Henry, and then, of course, at Shiloh Church on April 6th and 7th, 1862. Um, you know, Grant was um, ambushed, reinforced, wins a major victory. And after this leads to the capture of Memphis, of New Orleans and Corinth, Mississippi. Um, these were really significant locations to seize and it gave control um, to the Union of the Mississippi West, which was a very significant part of the Union's plan of blockading the South and using access and control of the Mississippi to cut the South in half, ultimately. Um, Shiloh was also a massively deadly battle. The casualties were shocking, over 10,000 10, for each side. Um, and this became an increasing uh, norm of this new industrial warfare. Um, no one had ever seen casualties in these kinds of numbers. And um, this was going to be the norm for the Civil War. It was an incredibly devastating conflict in terms of casualties. Here's the, that map again, just kind of dictating, showing to you the, um, the blockaded areas, as well as you can see in the purple, the areas of the Mississippi that are taken control of by, um, by Grant. And, uh, and this was, these were taking control of areas like New Orleans, um, were very, very important steps in um, facilitating the Union's attempt to effectively blockade the South and, uh, and, 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 and strangle it slowly. Civil War soldiers had, you know, a hard life. It was a little bit harder for a Confederate soldier than it was for a Union soldier, and that had a lot to do with the blockade. That had a lot to do with um, the decreasing amount of supplies that were enjoyed by the Confederacy as the blockade damaged their economy and made it more and more difficult for them to supply their troops. Um, rations were, were provided to troops. Um, Union troops ate a little bit better overall. Um, Confederate troops and Union troops had both had a, um, a bread or a carb ration. Uh, Confederate troops had something called Johnny Cakes, uh, based on cornmeal, um, the Union troops had hardtack, which was a, a very tough, um, a very tough like square um, um, flour bread flour thing that you didn't want to get wet because you would get it would get bugs and stuff in it. Um, they also had salted meats. Um, salted meats were salted so much that they were almost uneatable. Um, soldiers drank a lot of coffee during the war. Um, soldiers cooked too in camps. Um, they were when they were in camp, and of course, a soldier spends way more time in camp than they do in battle. Um, and so they they had to forage the land, find vegetables, and these types of things, and they cooked for themselves. Um, they spent a lot of time in camps. They spent a lot of time marching and drilling and these types of things. But of course, um, no amount of drill um, could ever prepare you for the realities of battle. Battle during the Civil War was more intense and thoroughgoing in, ter in terms of death and violence than any other conflict before. Um, major battles like Gettysburg could last um, several days. Battlefields at the end were strewn with bodies. Um, there was death all around. Officers did not lead from afar. Officers led by example, and they had, they had to give commands while in the heat of battle they had to prevent their troops from breaking amid pressure despite intense violence, smoke, um, um, incredible 
artillery fire, um, poor visibility, um, all of these types of things. And in these types of con in these types of battles, which could become a very intense, um, even even the most most well um, experienced um, unit could sometimes um, break and and flee the battlefield. And the officer's job was also to 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 help them to reconsolidate themselves when they did this, and and not to not to break ranks. Um, battlefields had stenches of smoke, of gunpowder, the smell of of human excrement that sometimes occurs in these incredible, frightfully frightful situations. Um, fear, death, noise, and this incredibly, incredibly um, um, violent type of conflict on a scale never really seen before um, inspired desertions on both sides, though um, desertions were at a minimal for both sides. The, the relative number is about the same percentage-wise. Um, and so the reason that many soldiers didn't desert, of course, would have been that camaraderie, that feeling of brotherhood and not letting your, your compatriots down. Um, but the Civil War battlefield was particularly challenging and particularly difficult and particularly deadly. Um, it was not uncommon for battles to result in thousands of dead, um, which was something that, uh, that was just not experienced with regularity before this, before this kind of new industrial war. Here you see uh, Union soldiers uh, with General George Meade. These are Union officers. These are all high command. I just wanted to show you an image of, of um, what an officer's tent looked like. Um, get an image of, of, of officers around camp. This is a this is a, a painting of the Battle of Chickamauga, Chickamauga, and um, I, I wanted to show you this because it, it just kind of gets you a feel for um, some of the violence on the battlefield, the smoke, um, relatively close quarters fighting, these types of things, and uh, obviously it's an artistic description, but uh, the battlefields were intense, they were violent, they were deadly, and they were very very. Um, they were very, very fear-inducing. There was a lot of bloodshed and a lot of death and a lot of, of, of very horrid woundings. Medicine during the Civil War um, was, you know, quite antiquated. There were some painkillers like morphine. Um, chloroform was also used, though in hard-up situations, um, a soldier might be asked to bite the bullet. Um, use alcohol to withstand an amputation. Um, surgeons often appeared more like butchers. Uh, their gowns were bloodied. There were piles of limbs. Um, if you were, if you received a a wound of the torso, it was almost it was almost a guaranteed death due to infection. Um, big caliber rounds were, were used. These are large calibers, and when they hit a bone, they shatter the bone, which results in, in infection. And this is one of the reasons why amputations were so common. Uh, nearly 20% of, of the wounded died of infection uh, during this conflict, including Stonewall Jackson. So by the end of 1862, you really see the Northern strategy become a strategy of total war, a war of attrition. It becomes a strategy to blockade and starve the South out. It became a strategy that targeted the, the, the Southern home front as much as it did the Southern army, target the Southern um, economy. It becomes a total war of attrition. Um, emancipation is used first. It's first called in 1862. It is formally um, um, dictated on January, uh, January 1st, 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation was used as a, as a strategy. It was strategic to um, free the slaves in the seceded states. Um, Lincoln did not enforce the proclamation in border states. It was designed as a strategic move against seceded states to basically create unrest within uh, within the states and undermine the what's left of the plantation system. 
And of course, one in seven slaves fled to Union lines. Um, it wasn't a terribly popular decision in the North. And had the war been begun as a war to, to free the slaves, um, likely it would have been not supported in the North. Um, but it does give Lincoln and the North an overall stronger moral position, um, internationally speaking. And this was another ultimate factor in encouraging international powers like the British to not support the South in favor of the Union. Of course, the British were sort of divided on that issue. Many of the aristocratic elements in Great Britain sort of related to the planter aristocracy in the South. Um, the strategy of the North now becomes, by 1863, a total war strategy to control the Mississippi and through that cut the, cut the South in two and enhance a total blockade to ravage Georgia and the Carolinas, cut them up from the inside. You'll see this with um, Sherman's March to the Sea to capture the capital of Richmond, which occurs at the end, uh, towards the end of the war. Um, to use attrition to ultimately wear down the enemy's strengths. So by 1862, the Civil War has absolutely become a total war of attrition. 